Welcome to the Vermont Vegetable and Berry Growers Association and UVM Extension Blueberry Grower Roundtable. This is really getting ready for the 2002 season and meant to be an open conversation among growers that are here, but we're lucky um, to have Ben Waterman of Waterman Orchards up in Johnson, Vermont. going to kick it off with some slides and thoughts about key elements of management he's been doing at his place for a number of years, pruning, mulching, fertilizing. We talked about this and he suggested we kick it off with those core practices that everybody has to manage, but can certainly get into other things as we go. So with that, thanks so much, Ben. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Vern. And it's great to see everyone. Uh, I do look forward to having this meeting in person one day. And as Vern mentioned, there's a lot of topics that we could cover in an hour. There's, there's probably 10 or 20 kind of core blueberry topics. But we thought that just given how we are in smack in the middle of, of uh, pruning season, that we'd really focus on that. And, and, you know, pruning is one of those topics that is just almost completely neglected um, and, you know, might be good to focus on and be really curious to hear what your pruning strategies are. I can share a little bit about what we do. Uh, and then we can transition into some other core kind of early season topics like fertilization and, and mulching. So I, I, I don't have much, I, I have a couple of slides. I can show a couple of photos and kind of describe what we do for a couple of minutes on each of those topics, pruning, mulching, and fertilizing. Uh, then I'd like to open it up so you all can share. I've got a couple of uh, interesting questions to pose to you. So uh, let me jump into my slides here. I guess while I'm doing, I can just introduce myself briefly. We've been growing blueberries for maybe uh, since, uh, it's been like 12, 13 years now, or probably our, our oldest bushers are maybe 15 years old. So we're kind of at that midpoint where we're, we've got established plantings, but we don't have crazy kind of, um, you know, uh, blueberry patches that you have to crawl through um, that are like, you know, 40 or 50 years old. So we, you know, we, we look forward to getting to that stage, but for now we're kind of in the sweet spot of, of maturity, but not, you know, too, too much growth to manage. Um, yeah, part of that is is because we do really focus on pruning. It's just, I mean, we're we're doing it all winter long. So hold on, on just a, a second. Overview of your operation too. I know it was in the write up, but maybe everybody didn't get that. Yeah, sure. Sure. On the blueberry side, we we grow about um, say four thousand bushes on five acres. We've uh, we've done three successive plantings, so we have. We keep we keep getting wider and wider in, uh, on our spacing, so less bushes per acre, but much more manageable. So currently, we're at I think the last planting we did, we're at a 15 foot wide spacing between rows, um, and we also do we're trying to establish a four or five acre apple orchard of kind of old heirloom varieties, and we also do um, getting more into spring strawberries. Uh, we do we have kind of three three prong market strategy. We've, we we do a, a very high volume farmers market. We do a you pick for just the blueberries, and then we do a bunch of wholesaling. So main main takeaway point here. Hopefully you can see the the full screen. Thumbs up, Vern. Can you yes. see the? Yeah, great. So main takeaway point I just uh, want to leave you with is that there really this what we're seeing here just beautiful, plump, juicy, perfectly ripe blueberries. You can see they're perfectly ripe because they're covered with bloom. You know that that light blue. Kind of light, light waxy tint. Um, yeah, it happens in that that kind of sacred moment of, of last few days of ripening. That's 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 all what we're seeing here. The main point is this really starts with this. Um, you know, high quality berries really start with a, a, a really focused and disciplined pruning strategy. That's been our experience. So this is just a you know, quick before and after shot. It's kind of hard to to photograph this uh, like effectively, but you know, the, the same bush you're, you're looking at on the left here is, is um, not pruned yet. And on the right is, is pruned. And it's, you know, it's, um, I, I brought a little um, branch here. I don't know, it's, it's this is probably not gonna work. I, I don't know if I should even bother to do like a little zoom pruning demo, but you know, um, 
what we are after is these kinds of canes that result from good pruning. You know, this this is we're looking at the top of the canopy now. You know, a lot of like pruning clinics you'll tend to is just focused on kind of lopping off older growth, you know, that's greater than an inch in diameter from the base of the crown. That's that's really important. But we actually do a lot of top pruning, what we call top pruning, um, which is and the end goal is is getting these nice um nice long kind of secondary canes. And so you know what you're looking at in the photo there is kind of the, the cluster of berries, obviously, but because the bush has enough net energy um, that comes from pruning, it's able to direct that energy into the, to the two or three or maybe four uh, new canes that are gonna be growing from the leaf buds right below the fruiting buds on the, on the cane. So you can see right here is about three really strong canes. Those, those are like, those suckers are 12 inches long. Uh, you know, that, that is awesome. That's really, that, that sets the whole um, plant up for uh, can, uh, the, the next clump of berries like you see here that will result at the, at the tops of each of these th three strong canes. So you, you're basically like tripling your yield every year if you can prune um, and if your prune results in these, in this kind of like secondary cane growth. So this is just another shot of kind of what that cane looks like. If you, uh, so it's just really nice and fat. It's got, it's got laden with fruit. This one happens to be laden with fruit buds. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be, there's, there's always that kind of delicate balance. Um, you know, there's, all the bud junctures that you're seeing on the cane here have fruit buds and that, you know, that might result in actually a little smaller fruit than you might want. Uh, so ideally, you know, every, every big strong 12 inch uh, secondary cane has got you know, two, three, four, five really nice fat fruiting bud sites. And then the rest kind of down below um, are leaf bud sites that can shoot up and result in what we just talked about kind of paving the way for the next year's uh, fruiting. So we approach pruning kind of, um, if you think about the architecture of the bush, we look at three zones. That's really our, um, kind of when we first approach a bush to, pr to prune it, we're looking at the bottom zone, kind of close to the ground where when we use, um, you know, the big, the big loppers for that, um, we, you know, we're, 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 that's kind of our first step. We're, we're lopping off big, much bigger growth, inch, inch and a half, two inch diameter, whatever is kind of old and dying. Uh, we're also pruning out um, kind of twiggy growth that, that's below knee high. That's kind of our threshold. Any, anything that's below knee high, we're pruning out, uh, unless it's a nice new cane that has a chance to get up and out and find sunlight and, and be the kind of the future of the bush. So that's kind of first zone is down below, below knee high. Second zone, we're looking at the interior of the bush, um, you know, really kind of contrary to an apple tree where you want that central leader, you know, a, a blueberry bush pruning strategy is more like the, the vase theory. You know, you've got, you, you really want to open out that middle of the canopy. And there's, there's so many reasons for that. Uh, you know, it's, you want air to be moving through that canopy, namely for spotted wing management and, and, um, making sure sunlight gets to those new canes that are coming up from the crown. And then the third zone we talked about a minute ago is this top pruning is really, um, you know, making sure that the tops of the canopies, there's enough sunlight getting to each of these major kind of secondary new canes. Uh, and there's enough net energy that the bush has to devote to this kind of growth. So that, you know, that it's kind of all about that net energy, right? It's, you know, making sure that the, the growth of the bush is devoted towards fewer and stronger canes, uh, i.e. actually fewer and, and bigger and better blueberries, uh, rather than devoting the same amount of, of energy to um, lots of kind of haphazard growth all over the bush, which results in, in lots of blueberries, but a lesser quality. That's sort of our, this uh, kind of all I had on the primer to pruning. But, uh, you know, why don't we open it up? What, um, I don't know, Vern, how you want to facilitate this, but, uh, you know, throw it in the chat or 
uh, uh, raise hands, but what's put things in the chat, but you don't have that many slides. Why don't you go through them all and open it up to everything? Okay, first, so you'd like me to cover fertilization and, and mulching first? Um, I don't know. That's what we usually do, but maybe yeah, we could mix it up. I don't see anything in the chat yet, but yeah. why don't we pause and people have questions. You could also unmute. There's not that many people on if you prefer, but chat's a good way to let everybody see what you're thinking. Yeah, what What is everyone... If if we do want to pause here, if anyone wants to chime in, what's what's been your biggest uh, kind of bang for your buck pruning strategy? What's what has worked the best for you? Kind of that that uh, the strategy from which you've seen tangible results. You know, really kind of obvious tangible results. You know, what what variety is that? You know, what what's what are you getting out of the the practice? As a question, what what do you mean by secondary canes near the top? Just any any cane that's growing that's not growing directly from the crown, um, uh, like at right near the ground. So you know it would be anything that's up in the canopy, really. Because one thing I'd add to your comment, maybe that'll help people understand. I mean, all the fruit comes from second year growth, so that that's you have to have that first shoot that Ben just showed, and then the next year the fruit buds are going to set. Well, they're going to set in the fall and they're going to fruit the next year. So nothing's going to come off of the older canes. And if you don't have that first year cane growth, you can't. So you're, at least the way I view your, your uh, comment, that you're setting up that second year cane for success. Question about willowy varieties like Blu-ray. Lots of canes hanging down to the ground. What do you do with those, Ben? Cut them out. Uh, you know, that uh, Blu-ray, a lot of folks have complained, actually, it's a pain in the ass to prune, but I, I really enjoy pruning it because uh, it is relatively straightforward. I'm, I'm losing a little bandwidth, so I'll cut off my camera for the moment. Um, yeah, you, you, you want to cut out all that, that floppy growth. You, know, you want to direct that energy towards upright growth in Blu-ray and blue crop and, and varieties like that. You know, and, and the other other pointer there on blu-ray is you know it's it's got so many so it tends to overdo on its new growth so you 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 do want to to prune out the um the new canes coming from the crown so you're left with two or three or four strong ones every year you know and the guidelines i think is more more on the spectrum of two so so five years down the road you don't end up with 50 different cane you know you want to keep an eye on that so here's a question about yield. This could be a chance to crowdsource uh, kind of the range we're working with. How do you measure yield, Ben? Is it by the acre or from your total 4,000 bushes? And if other people know their yields, it'd be great to type in. I mean, an acre could be a good way to just standardize this. What are people getting in harvest, harvested and marketable pounds per acre? What's your estimate, Ben? Just like a take a step back there, I, you know, it's it's a really interesting question because the all the research, all the studies that that uh, measure yield, and kind of all the talk around yield doesn't uh, you know I feel like it falls short on clarifying. I, you know, I think the word that you actually just mentioned, Vern, is kind of marketable yield. Yeah, that's that's really what we as growers are after is marketable yield. I I could care less about total yield. Uh, and blueberries is one of those crops that tends to overproduce. I mean, it's 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 pretty easy to get a big yield off a blueberry bush, you know. You, you it, but it's a totally different thing to get the type of yield that makes it easy for your pickers to pick or for you to pick. Um, makes it makes for um, to, you know make sure that every berry you're picking is finished and um, and is a high quality. So you know, back to pruning, it's. Yeah, the strategy there is the goal is marketable yield and to boost that. And, you know, I, it's, it's hard to say what that is per acre burn, you know, it's, um, you know, it depends on how well, how, how much pruning you do, you know, and like, I, I've just, I, I find a, a linear relationship between the time I spend in pruning and the marketable yield that results. You just get a bigger berry, you get a more exposed berry, like you see in the photo here. You get a sweeter berry. You know you're going to get fewer of them, so you might actually sacrifice some yield, especially in the short term, 
uh, some, you know, you sacrifice some total yield, but the marketable yield outweighs that. I don't know if you can see Sue's question there about timing, that they're getting three, sort of three sets of fruit. And she's asking if that third one, which is smaller and more tart, is coming from cane, she should be pruning out. It, yeah, that's, it tends to be variety specific. I mean, we're getting at the concept of synchrony. That's a kind of term used by apple orchardists to describe the the, the ripening window of the fruit, you know, like varieties and blueberry like Draper, they tend to, to, it's, you know, most of the berries ripen all the same time. So some, some blueberry varieties are just, it's a long window of time. Um, so, you know, the answer to your question might be, you know, maybe, uh, yeah, but it might be variety specific, but even within the same variety, you know, the answer to your question is yes. If you, if you're pruning heavily, um, you are going to tighten up that ripening window. You're going to, there's going to be less fruit that will be kind of just like petering out. And, you know, you're, you're just waiting on it to turn to fully blue and it's just, it's staying purple. It's staying purple. It's staying, you know, there's gonna be a lot less of that when you, when you prune out, you know, especially if you're pruning out the inferior wood or inferior canes, you know, if you've got big, strong um, secondary canes, like you see in the photo here, there's a very good chance that every single fruiting bud on those canes will be will be big, will be attractive to pollinators, will be um, will get all of the bushes resources into really finishing off every single berry. You know, so yeah, it's going to solve your problem. There's a question about training and retaining labor for pruning mulching. Do you have the same people coming back? Do you train them every year. How does that work for you? We've, yeah, we've, we've got a, we've got a crew, right? You know, our, our, um, we try to make our picking as fun as possible. We've got a sound system in our fields now where we play music all the time. We let all our employees uh, pick what they want to throw up, you know, they're, they're DJing. Um, you know, we, we've got, um, it's, we, we, we separate out our wholesale fields from our U pick. So we're not, we're, you know, we're not picking ourselves at all on our you pick fields. And, and so we can, you know, we, we can blast uh, Jimi Hendrix on our wholesale fields. We, we probably might, might not do that on our you pick fields. Um, we, we just try to make it as fun as possible. So yeah, we, we you know, I, I pay hourly, you know, that, that might be a difference, um, you know, in that the our employees don't need to feel stressed out. You know, they feel really kind of part of our team. They're not, you know, they're not a commodity. They're not just, you know, um, you know I, I understand the strategy of paying by the amount that a, that an employee picks, but it's just, um, I actually haven't tried that. So yeah, some of you might prefer to do that, but. Um, and the question it, was also about the labor for, uh, I think the pruning, you know, and, and the training around that, how, how does that work annually? It's, it's been a, it's been a real challenge. You know, it's, uh, we've got a couple of folks who, uh, who, who are learning, you know, and, and we're trying to train them. Um, you know, pruning is, is a skill and, you know, the efficiency, it's just, it takes a little while to, to, to develop to the point where you're going to be fast at it and just, you know, not need to think about your cuts and, um, so we actually have not gotten there where we have a fully trained up employee who is, you know, is, is fast, you know, on our picking, our berry picking side, we have a couple of guys that are, that, that um, hands down are better than us any day. But, you know, I'm, it's just, it's me and my wife, we're out there, you know, every spare minute of the winter, especially this time of year. Um, yeah, it's, it's a labor of love. Dale Riggs put in some Yield numbers, 6,500 to 7,000 pounds of berries annually off their half acre planting, 450 bushes. And my understanding is that's a pretty good yield because I think I think that's about the average yield in New York State per acres. Um, but there's also a lot of neglect, inadequate pruning, mulching, fertilizing. So other people want to comment on what they get without feeling shamed by Dale's high yields. That, that would be fine. And Joe is asking, how much potential fruit are you removing when pruning in order to maximize marketable yield? That is probably a tough question. The answer, I think, 
Do you have any sense of that, Ben? Uh, we strive for for no um, no loss in yield when we're pruning it. You know, we there are some cases where you you've got to prune extra aggressively, and you know you might be sacrificing fifty percent of a bush's normal um, capacity to fruit, uh, but. You know, and then there's also like this, you know, the other, the end of that spectrum would be where you really, you really need to regenerate a planting, you know, and you're, you're, you're basically mowing down and lopping off everything completely. Um, you know, obviously there's going to be a recovery period there, but, um, but really what we have found is that when we do not prune is when we're sacrificing the most marketable yield because we're getting the most drops at that time. We just can't keep up with the, with the vault with the number of berries that fruit on a on a poorly pruned brush yeah and the, you know they're just they drop before they fully they're hard to get to you know when you've got a mature bush that's diameter you know they're just they're in they're in the interior of the canopy where you, about like you know you got to kind of prune more heavily in the interior so you know we the more pruning that we do we actually again, find that our marketable yield increases. Thanks. A couple people chiming in with 12 pounds per bush as an average yield, which is pretty darn good too. And a question about, is it too late to prune? Because it's still getting cold. I would say no. Go out and do it before things leaf out. And Dale's piping in, removing 35 to 40% of the wood on many varieties. Some like Nelson, even more. That's interesting, Dale. Because you know, so what, how, when you do that on Nelson, you know, Nelson is one of these varieties that's very re reluctant to shoot up uh, new canes. You know, it's relatively speaking. So when you're taking away that much wood, are you finding that you that it results in new cane growth from the crown? We we get a lot of new growth from Nelson when we prune heavily. And what I've found is that if we don't prune heavily, all we get are small tart berries. And when we do prune heavily, we get lots of giant sweet berries. And, and Nelson for me has been more responsive to pruning than any of the other 15 varieties that we have. And Rachel from Allshead is chiming in. They've got 40 year old plants. They've been pruning hard for six years worry about yield going down but didn't go down much ended up with less drops and larger berries better for pick your own ryan down in western mass is piping in their goal is to reduce 30 to 50 percent of the buds when pruning partly by removing the entire canes partly by removing low less vigorous brushy branches so the take-home message here which i think is right on is intense pruning is very beneficial my observation around the state is there's an epidemic of inadequate pruning. People either put it off or don't get to it, or try and recoup with too many years in between, no pruning. And I think this is a big factor. And when you look at like the statewide yield numbers that New York has better numbers than we do, why they're so low. Uh, quick question about how many varieties you have in your fields, Ben, and then we should probably move on to some of your other topics. We have probably 25 um but the caveat there is that there's only about 10 that are reliable producers that are just like workhorses you know the, the others are more kind of heirloom and and interesting uh like like ruble for example we planted a whole block of ruble and that's supposedly got uh twice the antioxidant capacity of the uh, content than compared to a normal blueberry and that's it's just you talk about marketable yield. It's just, it's almost impossible to pick those. They're just, they're so tiny. So here's a good question. I'd love to have people type in the chat also because I get it all the time. What would you say are your top six cultivars, Ben, if you were going to recommend somebody growing in your neighborhood? And again, I'd love to hear others. Um, I guess I'll give two for each each um, season. Uh, the earlies, I, I like um, Spartan Patriot. For the mids, I um, I do like uh, Toro. It's Toro's kind of early mid. Um, Toro's doesn't. It's not really an aggressive variety, but it's got impress. It's it's uh, a pleasure to prune, 
and it uh, it puts off some beautiful uh, big berries. And uh, yeah, I like I like blue crop as well. I I feel like that's just one of those bulletproof time tested varieties that that's um, a mid season. Um, yeah, later season, I, I do love the Nelson. It's just, you can't, you can't go wrong planting Nelsons. And, um, you know, bonus is one, to, you know, that I, I'm partial to. I know a lot of growers have trouble with it and um, it does take a, more management to get good bonus berries. But when you, when you hit a bonus right on, I mean, they're just, the, the flavor is so dynamic and out of this world. And the berries are impressive. Great, thanks so much. Yeah. People are posting their own recommendations in the chat. So I'd say it'd probably be good to move on to fertilization, and we can always circle back. Um, quick note: there was a recommendation about the Felco electric pruners, and I remember Rob Meadows giving a talk about that in years past too. If you have any scale of planting, it seems like people <laughs> get tired with a manual pruning only. Yeah. So do you wanna to go to your uh, next slides, Ben? Sure, yeah, I, I don't have much more there, right? but yes. Uh, Vern, can you see the no Chilean nitrate? Not yet. There you go. I just showed up. This is, this is a key fertilization, just a, a kind of a basic for blueberry. And uh, it's uh, tons of studies have found that uh, the blueberries do not like nitrate. I know, you know, if you talk to North Country, they'll tell you, no, there's plenty of blueberry growers that buy Pro Holly with the chili and nitrate and they do just fine. And, you know, no doubt there's, there's, there's a lot of ammonium nitrogen in, in Pro Holly, regardless if it's got nitrate or not. Um, but if you want to optimize your fertilization regime, you know, nitrogen for blueberries, just, a, it's, it's so key. And, um, we found the best results when we're Chilean nitrate. You can order pro holly from North country without the Chilean nitrate, or you might be able to find it even in gar garden depots. Uh, but you know, we're, we're using all organic practices. So it's, you know, this, like our fertilization um, scheme might not apply to many of you, but we, uh, we're putting down uh, organic nitrogen early in the season. That's a, been a key for us, uh, right, right around bud break. You know, it's like, I, I've been getting to it about a week earlier every year. And uh, just if I'm, if I'm spreading dry product like Pro Holly, I'll, I'll, I'll spread it at that time. Even if I'm, if I'm, you know, we do the majority of our fertilization by fertigation, uh, you know, drip. And we, even if I, if I can get the irrigation system up and going by, uh, you know, I don't, whenever bud break happens, the earliest in the season, you know, I'm, 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 I'm starting to put on um, fish emulsion at that time. And I, I do like a, a micro dose throughout the season. I don't, you know, that's, I think the, the conventional recommendation now is to do, is to split your nitrogen applications at least half, half, you know, beginning and, and midway in the season and do not put down any nitrogen uh, later than, uh, what's, what's the official date, Vern? Like, I think, I mean, it's like in Jersey, it's all, it's all early season, bud break, blossom. I don't think there's anything after, uh, fruit set being recommended. Yeah. Yeah. We might, we might put down some for you if we feel like, uh, you know, if they, there's good moisture in this time, uh, you know, and, and um, yeah, we might put, put down a little extra fertilizer at that time, but yeah, for the most part, it's, it's on the front end. And, um, you know, we, we've got a couple of other Kind of elements we throw into the mix. We do do we do some sulpa mag. I've, yeah, it's been a challenge to find a soluble product that will will get into drip. But you know, you've, um, we do some potassium sulfate time to time. We've been experimenting with calcium applications. You know, there's no um, calcium is one of those key elements that's just critical to kind of fruit set and and 
forming a nice quality berry, but um, I haven't been able to kind of measure the results of calcium applications. I'd be curious to hear from all of you whether that's paid off, but we're just, um, we're, we're um, top dressing gypsum for calcium amendment. And, we, and we'll do that when we, when we do like a renovation for doing um, kind of changeover of um, ground cover or other kind of before we do a mulching, a big heavy mulch, we'll top dress gypsum. So that's, that's the basics So you know, what, what we're doing. Yeah, we, um, I can get into to mulching and, uh, and weed control a little bit as well here. I've tried every weed control, like organic weed control method under the sun, I feel like. I've, I've, I have failed miserably in so many respects. Uh, there's, you know, Vern, you remember seeing our place a couple of years ago. It's just, you know, it, it, organic weed control is the foremost challenge, it's been the foremost challenge for us with our operation. And um, so this is the strategy that we've, we've landed on. I, I, I don't want to say permanently, but kind of temp like, you know, it's, this is, this has been working for us for the past couple of years where we will spread a, th a three foot wide, uh, heavy uh, woven ground cover. Um, and it's kind of, this is heavy gauge stuff. Well, heaviest, heavier gauge, the better. Um, we'll spread that on either side of the rows. And it's, it's kind of, you, you feel, you feel kind of funny because a three foot wide strip on either side of your crowns, um, you know, sometimes it like eats into the middles of the rows where you're like, you know, it's just all ground cover. But, you know, what this does is it sets the, it just, it clears the whole root zone. And, you know, the, the bigger and the better the root zone, obviously, the stronger the bush above ground. Um, and this also, um, so we've got this strategy, we've got the weed cover in the, on the either side. And then what you do not see here in the photo is the mulch that will place in between kind of on top of the crown. So we'll come in after this step here, we'll, we'll lay on a heavy layer of wood chips or bark mulch. And we found that uh, by far sawdust or soft wood bark mulch is, is the, you know, there's, you can actually see the response. You know, there's, there's something about the tannins, uh, the polyphenols in the, in the dissolved kind of uh, leachate from soft wood bark mulch that I don't know if it's it's chelating iron or it's actually providing a source for the ericoid mycorrhizae fungi, uh, kind of a source of food for that fungi. But you can see a response when you put when you dump on a softwood bark mulch, you can you can almost see the, the bushes thanking for you for it. So it's this is kind of the basic strategy. And then, you know the, the reason why we're not smothering, you know, there, I've got another photo here. This is something else we've tried. Um, the reason why we're not doing what you see on the left here, we're just, you know, just the planting holes is because, you know, this, this ground cover is great for smothering weeds, but we believe it's really not optimum for improving soil quality over time in the manner that the blueberry bush really appreciates. Uh, there's just, you, as you can see in the photo here, um, you know, contrary to the marketing, to whatever the product marketing is, the, there's this, the products really repel water. Uh, there, the what you can see the water is pooling on the ground cover here. It's going to run off to the sides into the middles, and it's not, it's not feeding the whole soil ecology in, in the root zone of the blueberry. Um, you know, and, and the same goes for organic matter um, decomposition. This ground cover prevents that. You know, so there's a trade-off in using this stuff, and so that you know our our kind of halfway point our, our is um, heavily mulch in the middle strip. And then the weed management on the side strips. And then you can see sometimes uh, we get lucky and we get this sheep sorrel. This is an example of a living mulch. And this is something we foster. We, we, we have uh, all of our, our help. We're, we're, we do not weed this stuff out. You know, this is a blessing. It's, it's like a nature's weed control. It's a living mulch. And there's other species that you can work with here. There's, there's white Dutch clover you can seed in. Uh, there's other kind of native ground covers that um, that outcompete perennial weeds or other annuals, and, and at the sa and same time do not compete with the blueberry bush. Uh, you know, there's always the practice of just laying on very thick mulch. If you've got access to to wood chips or softwood bark mulch, or even 
you know, um, studies have shown that hardwood bark mulch does not necessarily uh, really increase the pH to a point where you need to be concerned about. It. There's probably a, a pH effect where you know you would want to kind of monitor things, but you know basically whatever organic mulch you can find if you've got access to it, you know the alternative to using ground cover would just be to lay it on you know eight inches thick, uh, six feet wide, on all your roads. We just you know it just takes truckload after truckload that's all I, I know some of you are probably mechanized so you can spread spread wood chips and spread mulch you know that's you know, as, you, as you get a little bigger that that starts to make a lot of sense uh, we we fabricated a kind of a live bottom so we can put in the back of our one ton that spits out mulch out the back so there's you know be very curious to to see all of your machines or hear about them so we can, we can open up the floor if there's other questions. I, that's about all the slides I had, I believe. The one question I had is what are you doing to monitor fertility? Do you do soil tests? Do you do leaf analysis? Yes. We, we, uh, the leaf analysis has been more important for us. You know, we, we will do the, we'll do the soil testing in conjunction with the leaf analysis, but the, um, we don't do it as often as we ideally we'd, we'd leaf test every year. Um, but um, in the past, we've really focused that strategy on uh, when there's a problem, there's an obvious problem. We will, we'll do soil and leaf testing. And, you know, we've, we um, like our biggest find this is three or four years ago. It was like an entire block that we assumed was okay. was, was really nitrogen deficient. This is just a challenge that we face uh, organic using organic practices is just you know, not being able to not getting enough nitrogen to the root zone or soluble nitrogen to the, to the root zone. It's very easy to top dress organic nitrogen and kind of get it on. But with so much um, carbon rich mulch in an organic system, it's really a challenge to get that soluble nitrogen to the root zone. So, you know, your, your tissue test can verify whether or not you're doing that. Where do you go, uh, Dairy One or elsewhere for your samples? Uh, we we like Maine. Okay. I um, have not used Dairy One yet. Yeah. yeah, the only advantage you get the, the Cornell table, but you can certainly find that online anywhere in New England too as the optimal ranges. But that's something I'd strongly advocate for. A really surprisingly small number of blueberry growers do the leaf analysis to guide fertilization. And soil tests for nutrients is not that effective. It's important for soil pH, but it doesn't usually align very well with what the plant's actually getting. So that's something to consider. I think it's $27 sample. Uh, there's some question here about the living mulches you talked about and whether they compete and um, how important do you think having a drip irrigation has been if you're going to let these things grow yeah i mean, i would advocate for a drip system regardless of what kind of mulching system you use it's just a, a back to that concept of fertilization be able to get soluble nutrients to the root zone there's no no better strategy for an organic grower than a drip system where you've got your drip lines kind of at that level of of uh, kind of under the mulch but right right in or on top of the soil um, so, so yes, yeah, so yeah, I, I guess it would be of increasing importance if you're going to have a living mulch, because you are going to get some, as uh, some, um, you, uh, excess evapotranspiration from that living mulch, but, you know, these species that the ideal species are very low growing. They're not, you know, they're not that vigorous. Um, it's just, they don't, they don't seem to use nearly the like mine the soil of nearly the the water resources that a perennial weed does and so you know i think taking a step back a little like if if you want to employ a a, a living mulch if you want to employ uh, a ground cover and 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 bark mulch hybrid kind of like we do or if you want to just use ground cover regardless of what you use we've learned kind of really the hard way is that the the perennial weeds are just the they're, they're um, it's so much easier to get rid of them prior to planting. It's, you know, if there's any new growers in the, if our folks are contemplating doing a planting in the Zoom room here, you know, the, the advice would be to take a good year at least to eradicate perennial weeds prior to even thinking about 
sinking bushes into the ground. Because, you know, quack grass or, or uh, reed canary, those perennial weeds, they'll poke right through this ground cover that we're seeing here. I mean, they'll, the living mulch will outcompete them, but will not, I mean, they'll, they'll perennial weeds will take over. I mean, they, they will outcompete the ground cover back. You know, there's, there's like, they are strong and uh, here to stay. So Ben, you might shut the screen sharing off if people do want to show themselves while they talk. Uh, there was a question about the pro holly. You're not putting that through the drip, are you? That's a dry application or are you dissolving that somehow? No, I've tried that. I've, <laughs> I've, I've tried, uh, I've got like these, uh, like take an old pair of blue jeans and tie a knot at the bottom and then pour, you know, pour each leg full of pro holly and then uh, soak that in a 55 gallon drum. And then, you know, and uh, it always happens is, you know, you do that, you know, it might work the first time and then you forget that you had that stuff sitting in there and you come back a month later and it's just, it's like an inf uh, just a infested nightmare. So no, we just top dress the dry and then we'll fertigate with any, any liquid product. And you sulfured before you started, right? The whole field or just strips and have you, ever had to reapply after that initial application? We, we used to just do strips and the, you know, learn the hard way that that is, that, that's probably not a wise practice because um, it's very tough to pinpoint the strips when you're, when, you're, uh, when you're adding your sulfur, it's very tough to stake out the strips and know exactly where to add your sulfur. You know, what invariably happens is you'll come back a year later to actually do the planting and you know, all it takes is, is setting your row two feet off of where you initially spread your sulfur and then you've got the wrong, wrong pH. So um, it's just much more efficient and a sure thing to do the entire field. And yes, it's, it is a, it's kind of a dance. You've got to come back and, and fine tune, you know, back to the point of leaving yourself enough time. That's really key in order to, you know, we, our standard practice now, whenever we do a, a new planting, we take two years. So the first year, um, you know, spring, maybe summer, we'll do, we might uh, broadcast sulfur into a cover crop and, um, and then till it in that fall, but, you know, and may, or, you know, or till it in that summer and take a pH reading that fall. So if we need to adjust uh, before the planting, we have a whole other, at least a, you know, a half a season to do that. You know, and, and we, uh, we've got handheld pH meters. That's another really good investment. If you know, for, uh, you know, if you think about a soil test, it's, every soil test you send off is 15 bucks. It's not much. It's a really good thing to do. But if you want to fine tune your blueberry production, you, you know, you're going to want to take pH samples all over the place, all over the time, all the time, especially during establishing, you want to verify that your sulfur amendments uh, went as planned. So we, we, we spend like, uh, you know, $150, $200 on a good handheld pH meter and, uh, you know, a good replacement um, electrode for that is about seventy-five dollars. We usually have one on, that one on hand, and and the uh, the buffer solution is probably another fifty bucks. So yeah, three hundred dollar investment will enable you to um, very accurately measure soil pH when you need to. What brand do you use? Uh, we have we use the Hawk. It's H A C H C H Pro Plus, I think it is, or Pro Pro pH Plus, or something like that. Been been very reliable. And I'd strongly caution against the really inexpensive ones. Not, not reliable in my experience. Um, Becky's putting some links in the chat about the uh, living mulch and also a link to the, the UMaine testing lab. Uh, question about plant size for starting a new planting. What, what, what do you use, Ben, when you start a new planting in terms of plant age? I love this question because we've changed we've changed so in, in this our strategy which it has changed so much over time we started out getting the two um, it's like the the four inch pots from from nurseries and you know and and throwing those in the ground and probably 50 to 75 percent of those fail in the field and we went to the one gallon pots and then you know buying them two years old from the nursery and, and then just straight out of the nursery straight into the ground and that's a lot better, you know, um, but still maybe 25% of your plants will fail that way. You know, and granted this, this, this is probably because I'm a really crappy grower, you know, all of you, I'm sure your success rate will be much better. Uh, but we, um, we went 
from that to healing in the two year old, um, you know, we'll either four inch or one gallon pots from a nursery, we'll heal them into our own nursery where we can really focus on soil building in that nursery over time, have the perfect blueberry soil ecology, uh, replete with ericoid mycorrhizae fungi, and the, the really nice, very well maintained drip system, and, and it's totally weed free. And we'll heal in bushes into that nursery now for two to two, one to two years at least before we'll take the bush out of the nursery and plant it. So it's like a you know the bush is about four year four to five years old before we'll plant it, and our success rate is you know we get maybe maybe five percent. Um, deaths of those bushes that we plant. Uh, and not to mention, we have a much quicker uh, turnaround before we get a really like a, a substantial marketable yield. Thanks, some great comments in the chat about fine tuning of fertilization based on tissue tests. And Dale is commenting about the importance of rolling up the weed mat in November to avoid bull habitat. Do you do that, Ben? Or have you had bull problems leaving it in place? We, we do not have a vole issue because we, uh, we've adopted uh, a system of, of low grow uh, turf grass in our middles where um, we have started trials. We've done a bunch of trials, uh, all kinds of different low mo turf grasses over the years and kind of landed on a couple. And so they, um, the voles don't, you know, the, the turf grass in the middles is so low maintenance. Um, you know, we're, we're able to very easily stay on top of mowing. You know, we'll, we'll mow half the frequency for kind of a normal um, kind of sodded middle or average kind of turf grass variety middle. So we're able to very easily stay on top of mowing because there's just less of it to do. Uh, and um, moles are always, sorry, voles and moles are just, they, they scatter. Uh, but I think Dale, you're making a really great point uh, you know, that there is a risk there and it's, you know, best practice is to kind of flop that stuff, the ground cover up, roll it up if you can. I, you know, I, I've heard other growers say that. And then, you know, another really great reason to do that is because if you do have any perennial weeds that are underneath that weed mat or that, that ground cover, um, rolling that ground cover up periodically, or even just like lifting it and keeping it loose above the soil dramatically prevents uh, crackgrass you know, those sharp, like uh, pokey rhizomes from poking up through that weed mat. It, it does really well at poking up through the weed mat when the weed mat is weighed down and is tight to the soil, especially if there's mulch on top of it. So what you're recommending, Dale, is, you know, it's, it's really, uh, you know, key to preventing that from happening. Ben, can you name those Lomo turf grasses variety or where do you get them? Our supplier has been all over seed and they, they, they can source all kinds of stuff. You know, if you want to play around with, you know, comparing varieties, we've, uh, the general class that we've had the, the best luck with are the hard fescues and um, uh, blue ray sheep fescue is one that's done really well. You know, the advice there would be to trial a, a couple because they are finicky, you know, they're, they're like, they're, they're bred for golf courses. And, you know, where it's like there's heavy pesticide and, and, you know, herbicide management systems. And so they, you know, one variety might work on my farm, but might not work on your farm. We certainly had a lot of varieties that petered out, you know, they'll, they'll establish well in the first year or two. And then you get some kind of strange disease that shows up as patches. And then all of a sudden the whole middles goes to, you know, dies off. So try a different variety, a couple of varieties, see which one works over time. In the chat, we're getting close to winding down. Any uh, final questions for Ben? You know, you know, SWD came up, Ben and I talked about this. We'll probably do a whole separate webinar on it just because there's a lot to talk about. <laughs> but one thing you did emphasize on the phone to me and briefly here, Ben, was the importance of pruning to open up the uh, interior and to remove the lower growth because that is where SWD likes to hang out. Yeah, have, have other growers found that? Has, um, just curious to hear from other growers if they've seen uh, you know, pruning as well as, uh, as weed control and, and mulching. Is, have you seen that to make a difference in the, the, the numbers of SWD that are showing up underneath so your canopies? Doesn't the sorrel and clover work against that principle? 
yeah, yeah, you, you got me. <laughs> you, you got it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, that is a consideration that, I mean, that's, that is an advantage. I think that that's clearly an advantage that, that well-maintained ground cover with no mulch, no, no weeds growing on top of it has over a living mulch. Yes. Is it's, you know, it creates that nice dry, great airflow that prevents SWD pressure. Question about monitoring. Have you had a, an issue? And so how have you managed it organically? I'm sorry, Vern. I didn't catch the first part of that. Mummy berry. Have you had an issue? We have we have not had any issues with mummy berry in the past like 13 uh, years of yeah, we were constantly disturbing our mulch. We're constantly mulching over what we have. Uh, and um, you know, maybe the pruning strategy also has something to do with it, but we thankfully have had zero problems. Question about birds. Your pictures what's your management strategy uh ours is i have a bunch of lunatics run around um banging on pots and pans and yelling all the time I, our our no our, our strategy is equally as as uh loony it just you know it's doing whatever the heck we can uh, we we have a whole mix of strategies we've got uh we've got bird guard sound system um, we've, we've got our other sounds, as I mentioned earlier, that's, you know, makes our employees happy where, where we can blast Jimi Hendrix in the field. We've got that sound going all the time. We've got whatever those balloon things are with the big eyes. We've got, uh, coyote statues and then something that we're getting into more just to make our you pick a little bit more fun is uh is is paper mache uh big puppets you know like uh like bread and puppet makes and we we hang those as scarecrows all over the place key with birds is change it up you know they get you know take some take a couple of weeks that's all it takes for a bird to get used to any one particular kind of nuance or distraction or whatever it is you're you're putting out there so we just, we try to change it up. We, you know, with the bird calls, you know, the bird guard system, we're moving the speakers around, we're changing up the sound chip, we're changing the volume. Uh, you know, the same goes for all the, all these puppets and everything we're hanging. We're just moving them around constantly. I know there's much more we could be doing. It is, you know, we just basically got to net the whole five acres when it comes down to. Sue's putting in a plug for bird guard. It's been effective on her farm. So you mentioned Jimi Hendrix twice. I'm wondering, is that a specific bird control strategy or any kind yeah. of loud music? Probably. No, I mean preferably uh, like Pantera or I don't, you know, something heavy. Or no, but but uh, but sweet reggae music works as well. You know, and it's just anything to make the birds wonder. It's a good question, though. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of Farm interest in uh, uh, pest management coming up. And uh, Joe's offering some mummy berry control advice, early scouting and sanitation. And certainly the pruning, I think, to get things to dry off is helpful too. Well, we've just about used up our time. It's one o'clock, so I'll thank everybody for coming and let you know we will have this uh, recorded. And feel free to follow up on the listserv with key questions and send the answers out to one and all. Take care, everybody. Have a good afternoon.